coming up. Learning how to survive in the wild with survivalist trainer B.J. Lauda. Growing up was just a part of life, but all of a sudden something happened in America where this way of life that I lived becomes something other people wanted. And Cherokee Nation citizen Harrison Shaw, one of the top ranked young golfers in the world. What it takes to become one of the best at such a young age. Plus Haley and Taylor Shirello, college students, native youth leaders, and surviving a health crisis together. I knew that there were big things that I wanted to do, and I couldn't let brain surgery keep me from doing those things. The future this brother and sister are building together. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. We are so proud to share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, spending some time in the great outdoors. For Cherokee Nation citizen B.J. Lotta, spending time outdoors is a way of life. He's a survivalist and teaches those survival skills to people who want to learn, people like me. In the middle of nowhere, <laughs> beautiful nowhere. So we're headed to our survivalist training and this is my friend Darcy Stevens driving. Hi. So we're near the Arkansas and Missouri state line. We're getting ready to go meet our survivalist instructors. Hey ladies, welcome to America's Survival Co. Base hey. Camp. How are you doing? My Hi. name is BJ. Nice to meet you. My name is Billy Joel Ladder Jr., but people call me BJ. I've been in the woods all my life. I've worked with Matt Tate at American Survival Co. as a lead instructor for about three years. I grew up in the Cherokee Nation, this little town called Stillwell, Oklahoma. I literally grew up since about fourth grade in a one room log cabin. So we hunted and we sourced our own meat, chickens, rabbits, all this. So growing up was just a part of life. But all of a sudden something happened in America where this way of life that I lived becomes something other people wanted. And so now there's a place where people want to learn these skills. You know, a lot of things that Native American people do out of necessity. What's the scenario that you're going to be teaching us? So our school, we're not trying to teach people how tough we are or how tough you can be. We just want to give people the knowledge and the skills that, number one, First Nations people have possessed thousands of years ago. And number two, it's some skills that make you feel safe whenever you are in a very dangerous environment. I'm excited. Yeah, let's do it. You ready to go and go for yes. a tour? Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. One reason fire is such an essential skill is because fire can be its own shelter. If you can feed that fire wood, you will not die of exposure because it'll keep your body temperature at a level that hypothermia cannot set in. So these are the four basic parts to a bow drill fire. It's just a simple machine. Fire board, the spindle, the bow, and the hand hole. So we would make these with our knife that we have with us. Right. So never leave home without a knife. Don't ever leave home without it. All right, ladies, who's going first? Jen's going first. Okay. Go first. Okay. <laughs> You just keep swinging naturally. Just a little faster. There you go. Watch the end of that bow. Oh, I see smoke. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Does she have a coal? Maybe. Please, 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 please. Wow. So I'm take your bird's nest. It's still burning. So you just dumped it in the middle of the nest. You notice he's kind of tacoing it slowly and gently around it, giving it oxygen. And if you watch, he's gonna start, there you go. It's gonna have fire coming out. Wow. 
That was pretty fast. Fire! Burn your eyebrows off, man. <laughs> but now that we got this part of the course taken care of, you want to see what a overnight shelter would look like yeah, that would sustain sure. you for four or five yeah. days? We would probably build one of these, but this would take about five man hours to get to the stage it's at now. Uh, even though these are cut with a saw, you could build this without a saw or a knife. You just would break limbs. All you want these to do is support the debris you would pile on top of it, which would be about a foot. You could get in there lay down and see how soft it is, Darcy. OK. You ready to spend the night there? Uh, <laughs> could you do it if you had to? I think I could do it if I had to. I, I just, I, I'm terrified of spiders, but I don't think it would be a factor at that if point. My life depended on it. Yeah. This is my drama. <laughs> so let me say something. Darcy definitely is nervous about spiders. So we, people would give her a hard time, but in a real survival situation, being nervous like that could cause you to make big mistakes. This is actually pretty comfortable. But now get out and just lay on the ground. Try that out and see. Now you can really tell how cold the ground is. Oh yeah, I can already feel it. Sometimes just setting, watching the sunset or the birds fly can be very therapeutic. You know what I'm saying? And for me, it's just my place. At one time, this was the only thing I could do as a kid. I didn't have nothing else to do. So it's so much a part of me that it makes me feel like a kid again, you know? So when you're out here playing with sticks and making forts and, you know, playing in the creek, and that's what you did as a kid. But now it's a legitimate skill that I have and I can teach others. And so that makes it all the better. Should work good here, B. Yeah, this is a real good spot right here. You know, this water looks real pristine, especially here or down how clear it is, but definitely do not want to drink straight from a stream source. So we're going to teach you a very simple way that you can minimize the risks of getting dirty water. This is not going to be 100% guaranteed, but it's going to bring your risk factor down to a very minimum edge for Girardia and Cryptosporidium. All right, let's do it. The deeper she's digging, the cleaner the ground is, right? And also that water is gonna have an opportunity to be cleaner because it's filtering itself. Okay, you should come look and see what this water looks like now because it doesn't look like it's gonna be drinkable. <laughs> it is very drinkable. Yeah, it'll turn out pretty clear. So, so we'll come back to this? Yeah, come we'll back let to this stand for about 10 minutes and while that's doing its thing, we'll go check out some more Yeah, plants. we can do a plant walk. Okay. okay. All right guys, I'll show you a few medicinal plants. Here's one that's uh, really common, can be found all over the U.S. especially. This is your common mullein, or the Cherokees call it rabbit's cabbage. I can see why. Yeah. It's, uh, it looks like a tobacco leaf. It's real furry. It can be used for uh, anywhere, something like uh, nature's toilet paper. But the real medicinal use is you would dry this and smoke it like tobacco, right? It helps your bronchial tubes, helps inflammation. Even treating asthma with it. Yeah. Um, anything with the upper respiratory system. Well, it looks a little more clear on the top. Huh? Yeah. You can see some of the rocks at the bottom. That's very drinkable. And I would rather do that a million times than drink out of that once. Does it taste, taste gritty? Tastes like water. It wasn't as gritty as you thought, huh? No, it's not gritty at all, actually. I mean, it literally just tastes like bottled water. You're right. Well, thanks for teaching us. I've learned so much. It kind of changes your perspective on things, so. Absolutely. You know, when I look at that, what I would call a weed in my garden, I might look at it differently now. And yeah. What I learned is that nature isn't your enemy, it's just the lack of knowledge that's your enemy. So. Yeah, that's good. And that's it. That's what makes us safer in any situation in life, is just being well informed. We survive. All right, one, two, three. See y'all.
Cherokee Nation citizen Harrison Shaw is a championship golfer, recently ranking 18th in the world. Not bad for a kid just now heading into middle school. Yes, dunk it. Oh, yeah, I'm really good at dunking it. I'm really competitive about everything, about sports, to who gets to press pause on the TV remote. Okay, time out. My name is Harrison Shaw, and I'm in fifth grade. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm a golfer. The earliest memory I probably have was probably when I was like three or something. I see pictures of me hitting the ball on that green right there. He was playing at one and a half, you know, two years old, uh, just because his older brothers, just trying to keep up with his older brothers. <laughs> and so that's kind of how he, he got into it. Well, my mom and my dad love Tiger, and I've never seen him before, but when I did, he was just, I liked him. He mentioned like Tiger. I think that's what got me interested in golf. Him, you know, back in the late 90s, 2000s, being so successful, being an African-American golfer. Um, so as I got into it and the kids started playing. His swing is just smooth and he doesn't like stop at the ball. He comes all the way through. He has a grip that I, tr I'm trying to perfect. He, does like this interlock grip where he does that and I've been trying to perfect. So this is a leaf basket that I made at a Indian healthcare camp or wellness camp. If you can see, there's only like this right here. There's only like this little thing. That's what she provided us with. And then we had to start and we had to weave around and weave around and weave around. If we messed up, we had to go all the way back and weave around and weave around. And it's, it, look, it looks cool. My mom's side of the family, everybody's Cherokee, and like it's kind of cool that since I'm Cherokee in my golf game, I get to be on TV and that people will know me for playing golf and be Cherokee, so that would be nice. Cherokee Nation gives you an opportunity to, to, show to showcase mm -hmm. how you're representing Oklahoma and the nation and doing big things. This year, in 2018, I got uh, this Oklahoma runner-up, so it was like the people from Oklahoma and around Oklahoma can come. I was actually the best Oklahoma kid for my age. And this is from the world championship that I got for because I placed 18th. I played at Pinehurst this summer. I played with 157 people. World. It felt good that I've known them the 18th best 10 year old in the world, so. Me and my dad will go to the golf course probably like three days a week. I'm his caddy, also his psychologist. <laughs> Try to keep him, keep him calm. One thing about Harrison is even though at the actual moment you tell him he's resistant, he's a quick learner. Most of the time, you just want to like pursue it and like be the best at it because everybody around you is getting better, and like you have to get better if you want to get to the next level and be at the top. To practice a lot if you want to be good at something. Like we go outside, we just practice, and I have a putting green in my hallway that I just practice on, like 30 minutes a day, just practice my putting on my stroke. When you practice, it's like you have to commit to it. So like if you commit to academics, you commit to your homework, you commit to reading, you commit to everything that you do, and you're like, you'll get better at it. Like golf and putting, just, that's one thing that I've brought to my school and everything else. You gotta commit to what you wanna do. It's just, it's a really tragic thing, uh, almost a, a second trail of tears for these families. 
During World War II, the United States government built military training camps to prepare U.S. troops to fight overseas. The federal government condemned and confiscated thousands of acres of land in order to construct training facilities and barracks to house U.S. military troops. Camp Gruber was established near Bragg's, Oklahoma in 1942. The U.S. Army base is named for Brigadier General Edmund L. Gruber. The camp serviced U.S. Army units including the 88th Infantry Blue Devil Division and the 42nd Infantry Rainbow Division. Camp Gruber also served as a prisoner of war camp, incarcerating approximately 3,000 captured German soldiers. Covering more than 65,000 acres and at a cost of $30 million, Camp Gruber seemingly sprang up overnight in the Cookson Hills region of Oklahoma. All through here, there's 16,000 acres out just in this section that we're in. There's another uh, 16,000 to the south of us. And then uh, over next door in what's the actual Camp Gruber these days is like 33,000. See this wall that's, that's coming up here? There's probably about a half a mile of it, at least, at least that we can see. And uh, it's, it's man-made and it goes with some of the homes that were out here in a pre-1940. The construction of Camp Gruber took a heavy toll on many Cherokee families. During the 19th century, the Cherokee Nation already lost an immeasurable amount of land, culminating in their forced removal from their ancestral lands in the southeastern U.S. This removal in 1838, known as the Trail of Tears, forced Cherokees into Indian Territory. Cherokee land in Indian Territory began to be chipped away as well. By 1880, those lands were being sold off many times by force to other tribes or pioneers eager to claim the land as their own. This loss of land made way for Oklahoma statehood in the early 1900s. Much of the approximately 65,000 acres used to build Camp Gruber was acquired through condemnation of Cherokee-owned allotment land. This forced removal of Cherokees from their allotment land affected more than 70 Cherokee families who were given just 45 days to pack up their lives and leave their homes. Many Cherokee families had to leave behind almost all they owned in order to meet that deadline. Their forced removal meant leaving behind unharvested crops on family farms, schools, businesses, and family cemeteries. Many Cherokee families, like the Summerlin family, packed up and left the only life they knew. We lived in uh, Grandma and Grandpa's house. Grandma had died. It was on her allotment land. And then Mom and Daddy got married, and they moved in. I, I do remember it was in the, in the summertime. We had to leave on a real short notice. And everybody left their crops in the field and, and just, and the just moved out. And, uh, and we left everything. We left a, uh, an organ in the house and a big trunk full of pictures that I know of. I don't, I don't know what else we left, but I know we didn't get it all. But of course, we just had a wagon to move in, and that you can't put very much in a wagon. This is us six kids the day that we moved from Yellowhammer and they had given us 45 days warning. Daddy said that he got paid $900 and then they went to court. He got another 300, but he had to give the lawyer half of it. And that's the way with uh, several of them that went to court, that it just almost wasn't worth the trouble. In 1947, two years after the end of World War II and just five years after Cherokee families were removed to make way for the camp's construction, Camp Gruber was deactivated. It would change hands with several U.S. agencies throughout the 1950s and 60s when most of the original buildings and facilities were removed or destroyed. Today, Camp Gruber operates as an Oklahoma Army National Guard training facility. Let's talk Cherokee. Where are we going? Hadla Inega. Hadla Inega. Where are we going? Hadla Inega. Hadla Inega.
Haley and Taylor Shirello are a brother-sister duo ready to take on the world. As self-made ambassadors for young Native Americans, they're building upon their Cherokee heritage to make a difference and create a positive future for others. Uh, my name is Taylor Shirello. We're down at Yona Dagwadoa, Oklahoma City, Janela. Um, I am from Oklahoma City. I am a Native American Studies major um, and also a double major in Health and Exercise Science. My name is Haley Shirello, and I am a freshman at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm double majoring in Health and Exercise Science and Native American Studies. I have three siblings, and little Zane Micah, who is 13, Clayton, who's 17, Haley, who is 21. She's the only girl in the family. Haley and I, we're pretty close. We've grown up, obviously, her whole life. She's been around me, and I always had the responsibility of, you know, being her big brother. Taylor and Haley have been close ever since there was a Haley. She's all boy and she's all girl. Taylor's always been a fantastic big brother, always stood up for his little sister. And Haley is fierce and she's always wanted to do everything that he could do. Why I decided to attend the University of Oklahoma was the Native American Studies program. Whenever I discovered that OU had something so unique and so amazing, I had to jump on it. I just wanted to build on everything that my mom had taught me, everything that my grandfather had taught me. I just got elected um, to be the director, co-director of inclusivity for the Student Government Association here at OU. I always grew up kind of knowing that I wanted to have leadership roles whenever I went to college. We're basically working on a whole bunch of different things. The one that I'm most excited about, obviously, is the Indigenous Land Acknowledgements. So, uh, somewhere in there, this may not be for athletic events, but something we definitely want to acknowledge is the land grant and how this land was granted to become the university and things something like that. Something that acknowledges that the University of Oklahoma is residing on Indigenous Native American tribal lands. And understand the importance of that, the significance of it, and why it's important to recognize it as well. This is such a, such a crucial, such a fun time um, to be able to be working, you know, firsthand on all this that's going down. I just really, really, really wanted to encourage people to be leaders on campus um, by holding positions of leadership. I really wanted to, you know, give people in the American Indian Student Association an, an opportunity to lead. Um, because when you lead, you can have a voice. And when you lead, you can give a voice to the people that don't have it. My life turned upside down when I was 14 years old. I went in for a routine eye exam at the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. She discovered that I had pressure on my optic nerves. They were swollen to the size of her lobes in her brain. After many brain scans, many MRIs, I was diagnosed with hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus, it's the accumulation of fluid in the third ventricle of the brain. I had a very severe case and I had to have emergency brain surgery. Really didn't see this coming with Haley. I didn't want to believe it. She had perfect vision too, so there was no reason to suspect anything. I just remember being really, really scared. And it was a lot to take in. It's just a time you just rely on your faith. Haley comes out of brain surgery, they give you back your kid. It looks like the same kid, and you know she's there, but you kind of have to be reintroduced. And it was then that I knew everything was different. That was the place that I knew this is gonna be a different path we're on. You don't just walk out of here and you just don't get to be the same. My parents were really my rock, my foundation during that time. And it was so great that I had them to lean on during such a scary time. They said, Haley, I know that you can make it through this and you're gonna have a story to tell. You have a story to share. I knew that there were big things that I wanted to do and I couldn't let brain surgery keep me from doing those things. Baton twirling really served kind of as the therapy for me. It helped me to 
want to get better, get back to being the best me that I possibly could. Everything definitely starts to make sense once I have a baton in my hand. The whole world just kind of becomes a brighter, happier place, and I feel like I am in my zone. I feel like I'm the best Haley whenever I'm twirling a baton. I get to put myself to the test. I get to push my limits, and it's so fun. It's such a huge, thrilling environment. I am the current Miss Majorette of Oklahoma. I've held that title for the past five years. It is an amazing opportunity too to get to share my Cherokee heritage, to get to tell people. Part of why I am who I am is because I'm Cherokee. Part of why I'm Miss Majorette of Oklahoma is because of my family, my upbringing, because I'm Cherokee. There's definitely that sense of, oh no, what could happen? You know, am I gonna drop it? Is something gonna go wrong? But I feel like that's kind of an excellent metaphor for life. You just had to keep going. You had to keep twirling and knowing that, hey, even if I don't catch this, even if I don't have this, life's gonna keep going. And you just pick up and you start twirling again. And it makes a beautiful routine. bless us with and thank you for this time that our family just gets together and um, spend these valuable moments together. I know deep down my family, what how they instilled my my Cherokee values in me and my Cherokee culture and language and things. I, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I want to help inspire other young Cherokee kids and help them to know you have come so far, your family has done amazing things and you can do even more. I hope that everything I'm doing right now will help the next generation of Cherokee youth. I want to inspire them. When I look to the future, I just see myself serving people in some way. My grandparents just really instilled in me the love that I have for the Cherokee people, the love for my own heritage, and everything we do is because of our brave, rich heritage. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dodadago ha'i. What up?